é o caminho do Anoni, a estrada. Ele vem pelo The road is the path of the Anoni. The seed latches onto car wheels and it starts multiplying wherever it falls. African lovegrass has already taken over 2 million hectares of prime grassland in southern Brazil, Uruguay and Argentina. That's roughly the size of 2 million soccer pitches. The Nature Conservancy, an environmental group, estimates that lovegrass has cost the Brazilian economy over $30 million in the past decade. Faced with an impossible task, Walter Peter has enlisted the help of scientists to try to come up with solutions, but the odds are stacked against them. Anoni can produce up to 200 kilos of seed per hectare, and the seeds can remain viable for over 40 years. So you could argue that amongst the family of grasses, there is nothing that propagates so efficiently. The only glimmer of hope requires a short-term dent in productivity to ensure long-term sustainability. After four years of study, the only practice that seems to work against this grass is to allow fields to remain fallow without cattle for a while, so that the native vegetation can fight back. Walter Peters now diversifying his crop to give nature more of a fighting chance. When you have a monoculture over a large area, it is easier for it to be attacked by pathogens, fungi, or even an invasive species breaking its resistance. The area covered with love grass is expected to double by 2015, according to the Global Invasive Species Program. Extinctions are forever, but Invasive species provide a nice parallel here because usually invasions are forever. It's not something we can turn the clock back on. And that seems to be the case here in a corner of Queensland, Australia, where locals are facing up to life with the great invader. These Queenslanders take pride in their roughneck image. Tonight, they're betting money on one of the top 100 most destructive alien species. Ladies and gentlemen, the following show could be deemed politically uncorrect. But up here in far north Queensland, we don't give a stuff about that. Meet the cane toad, or lucky number seven, as he's known tonight. Making a big move is number three on the outside, number three. It's Carlo, ladies and gentlemen. Now he hasn't touched it. He hasn't touched it. Yeah. Did he touch it? Oh, yeah. It's three. But the cane toad is far from benign. It's devastating Australian wildlife and hampering irrigation. Frustrated by a sluggish response from the authorities, some Australians have declared war on the toad. We're going to head to Newry Station, which is pretty much all directly on the front line. Over the wet season, I've got to work out how far they've moved west, as that's the time of the year that they do, they do breed and move, and then get in there and basically uh, GPS all the locations to get the mop-up teams in there to do the work. The cane toad was introduced in 1935 from Hawaii to help eradicate the cane beetle, which was destroying Australia's sugarcane crop. The toads didn't eat the beetles, but they did find lots of other prey and spread like wildfire. There are now an estimated 100 million cane toads marching across northern Australia with rivers and irrigation channels providing express routes. We keep going along like this, we spot another toad, you go pick it up like that, bring it back to me, pop it into the bag, okay? The toads come out at night so the toad busters scour watercourses and lakes to catch them before they breed. Each toad starts as a tadpole, grows into a small toad or metamorph before becoming an adult with a formidable reproductive capacity. Around this area, there's probably you know, 20, 30 toads, mature toads in this area. So they've probably bred three or four times here, I'd say, over the last wet season. Each female toad lays up to 35,000 eggs per season. Cane toads also have voracious appetites, and they will devour all the insects and small reptiles in an area, leaving the local wildlife to starve. 
Volunteers come from as far away as New Zealand to make a last stand against the toad. Roll up your swag and put on your hat. We're going to check our King Toad trap. Here, children are doing their best to help protect the two million hectare Kakadu National Park. They learn that the amphibian has a powerful defense against predators. Here is the toxic from the toad that kills all the animals. So they release them when they're stressed. So these are the big, big points. But they're all effort everywhere in the skin, a little bit toxic. Eggs, dead balls, metamorphs, juveniles, and adult toads, they're all, all toxic. They're toxic, but the native wildlife haven't learned that. Some of Australia's most important species, such as crocodiles, monitor lizards, and rare snakes, are eating cane toads and dying from their poison. Our biodiversity and wildlife is really incredibly valuable to a place like this. It's a big part of our tourism industry. The cost of trying to protect that biodiversity is, is going to run into the millions of dollars. Cane toads also find irrigation pipes and drainage channels an ideal feeding and breeding place. One large cane toad can block a pipe completely, destroying the irrigation system and a farmer's crop with it. You do get cane toads that come through and damage your channel so you don't get proper drainage. You can have some pretty big losses. If it's 10% of turnover, that's $300,000. With tiny resources, the toad busters make a token effort at reducing the invader's population. They are permitted to use diluted dettol on privately owned land to kill the juveniles because it has little effect on other wildlife. But for the fully grown toads, they need more serious measures. See my hat, it's got the slayer on it. And that's why, because I usually am the one that euthanizes. The toad busters calculate they've killed around 250,000 adult toads in the past three years. But with at least 100 million cane toads, that's barely made a dent in the exponential increase in toad numbers. Both the state and federal governments are starting to put money towards the uh, beating the toads, but it's nowhere near enough. Like we're talking um, tens of thousands. We really need to be talking tens of millions because the long-term impact of this toad, you, you won't be able to measure the cost to the environment. The Australian government say they've provided $18 million of funding to help stop the toads, including paying for Nifty. Australia's one and only cane toad detection dog. We muzzle her so she doesn't bite on the toad when she finds him. Yep. And we put the doggles on because when she goes through the long grass, sniffing through the long grass, she gets grass seeds in her eyes. And also cane toads can shoot out poison from their paratoid gland. Always do that. Nifty is the only canine guard on the Western Australia oh, state line with the toad invaded Northern Territory. Is that a pair? Nifty does quarantine, she checks vehicles. Toads have been known to hitchhike on vehicles. Is it in here? Is it in here? We get a lot of reports of people finding them in and around their cars. We don't want any cane toads coming through the WA. But some local politicians are saying the government isn't doing enough to solve the crisis. I guess if you scratch it all together and you might get 15 million over the last 10 years. I think the Queensland government put up a million dollars um, guilt money for um, research on, on cane toads, but that's all really been spent in setting up chemical laboratories and stuff to do chemical analysis on cane toads, which is really marginal. Scientists from Cornell University estimate that invasive species, including cane toads, cost Australia over $6.8 billion a year. And despite the toad buster's best efforts, the cane toads are spreading across Australia at around 30 kilometres a year, devastating the wildlife in their path. So who are the people with a vision to keep nature in working order? In each episode of Nature Inc, the end note comes from the visions. This week we hear from a scientist leading the growing battle against invasive species. Everybody should know about this. You know, it's no good just to have a group of experts in a room making recommendations that can be ignored or not ignored by different countries. If you look at the predictions 
air travel is going to increase for the next 25 years or so. So it, it's a problem that's not going to go away. And I'm not saying that globalisation is all bad and that we shouldn't travel in aeroplanes or we shouldn't eat certain species or whatever we do. It's that we've got to think about the risks associated with that. On Nature Inc. next week, we test the claim that corals are worth up to $30 billion a year to the global economy. And we report on steps some nations are taking to protect them.